Aksameach. Here we are, the seventh day of Unleavened Bread, and I have a very special message to give today, a prophetic message called The Time of Jacob's Trouble. So I want to start in Joel 3 and verse 9. Joel 3 and verse 9 says, Proclaim this among the nations. Sanctify a war. Awaken the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Gather yourself and come, all you nations, and gather yourself together all around. O Yahweh, bring down your mighty ones. Let the nations be awakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there I will sit to judge all the nations all around. Put in the sickle for the harvest is ripe. Come, go down for the press is full, the vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of Yahweh is near in the valley of decision. While the sun and the moon shall be darkened and the stars shall gather in their light. So, what I want to share with you today, it's a very uh, exciting message in one way, a sobering message in another way. But I want to share why I believe the time of Jacob's trouble is at hand. Uh, again, I'll say before, and I'm not predicting anything, the times and seasons are in Yahweh's hands. But Yahweh, over the last uh, four or five years, there have been many, many signs that we're getting close to the end. And every sign he's shown to his congregation. Some signs have been in the world, like the blood moons that, uh, you know, were books written and everything else. But just, but many other signs, such as the Tabernacle of David, uh, was only shown to Yahweh's congregation. And now we have a convergence of signs that are here now that I believe is, is just too overwhelming to be a coincidence. And that's what I want to share today because we are really entering a new time uh, in the end time. So we're in that valley of decision. I think for Yahweh's people, we've all been there for the last couple of years because from the Shemitah time, the Shemitah was a time to wake up. It was a time to get our life together. It was a time for us to realize the times we're living in. And it was a time to build faith in Yahweh. And that's what it's all about because without faith, it's impossible to please him. Some people followed, some people didn't, some people did some. But time doesn't stop for individuals. Time doesn't stop because some people simply uh, are too much into the world or too much into this. Time continues to go by. And there is a point where we're out of time. There is a point where, you know, the end time will come and the kingdom of Yahweh will come. And like I always say, there will be more people lost in this generation than, than ever in the history of man. So it's a really, really serious time that we're in. And we do have to take these times serious. But now we're moving out of that valley of decision. And for those who made the decision to put Yahweh first in their life and whatever that means in their life, praise Yahweh for that. And those who didn't, the decision is being made for you. Because indecision is also a decision. And we're from that time that we're ready to move out of that valley of decision. Uh, before I get into all the different things I want to go over today uh, of why I believe we're heading into the time of Jacob's trouble, I just want to rehash maybe for the next 10, 15 minutes on the miracles that prove this is the last generation. So some people, may, you know, there's people that say Yeshua uh, it was never even alive. He wasn't even a character. There's people that say Yahweh doesn't exist. So people could say almost anything. Uh, we're in the, the realm of fake news. We're in the realm that people can get away with putting anything on the Internet. But at the end of the day, uh, there are absolute miracles that have happened in this time period that certainly prove this is the last generation. There's no doubt about it. Matthew 24 and verse 32, Matthew 24 and verse 32, because I've probably given over the years a hundred uh, different sermons about this all over the world. Uh, every Sukkot, I usually start Sukkot with dealing with the importance of Israel being a nation in the end time. But without a shadow of a doubt, Matthew 24 and verse 32, I always that's always the first scripture, because that's what Yeshua said to watch for first. Matthew 24, 32 says, But learn the parable of the fig tree. When its branch becomes tender and it puts out leaves, you know that summer is near. So also you, when you see all these things, know it is near at the doors. Truly I say to you, in no way will this generation pass away until all these things have occurred. So clearly it's not going to be like the 
Uh, Daniel 9, 70 weeks prophecy, that's over 483, 490 years. In the end time, it will be one generation. There will be one generation. Psalm 90, we'll get into that a little later, but Psalm 90 clearly tells us that the life cycle is 70 years. That's a generation. That's the life cycle is 70 years. So uh, I'm going to get into a little later all the things of these 70 years now, the conversions that's coming here. But it is exactly 70 years since the time that Israel has become a nation. Uh, but there's much more from there. But just this is the point of it. This is, this is the ground zero of the end time. That Yeshua clearly said that there would be one generation. There would be one generation until the end. And we're not in the beginning of that generation. You know, when we look around uh, from the beginning of Israel being a nation in 1948, and like I always say, the 50s were worse than the 40s, the 60s were worse than the 50s. The 70s, every, every decade has progressively gotten worse. And now, wow, we are just in such a, a immoral, I mean, the last uh decade but particularly last two three years things have just changed so so quickly that even people in the world see it people that aren't even religious see how much things have changed to the point now where babies are born and they don't even give it a gender until the baby is five years old that the baby can decide whether it wants to be a male or a female and bathrooms no longer men and women but but just unisex bathrooms and even to have uh full birth abortion aborting babies after they're born. We're living in just an evil, evil time, and that time is getting ready to end. So Israel is the, the fig tree, no doubt about it. Yeshua said all this would happen in generation. Psalm 90 tells us a generation is 70 years. And then Psalm 102, Psalm 102, another scripture I go into a lot. It's a powerful uh, scripture because it talks all about the Holocaust in the beginning. I'm not gonna get into there but clearly prophesies about the Holocaust that's going to happen. And then in verse 12 and 13, after the Holocaust, it says, But you, O Yahweh, shall dwell forever, and your memory to generation and generation. You shall arise, have mercy on Zion, for the time to pity or yea, the appointed time, the Moed, has come. So after the Holocaust, it was the appointed time for Israel to become a nation again, and Yeshua said it would be for one generation, right? And then the end would come. So if you drop down to verse 16, when Yahweh shall build up Mount Zion, he shall appear in his glory. And like we said, they were building Mount Zion for 20 years. Mount Zion is rebuilt. The tabernacle of David is found. So this is not something that will happen. It's something that's already happened. And who is this written for? If you still have any doubt, verse 18, this shall be written for the last generation. This shall be written for the last generation and people to be created shall praise Yahweh. So it's written for the last generation, not a generation to come. In the original Hebrew, look it up. It's this shall be written for the last generation. So very, very clearly, the generation who saw the Holocaust is the generation who's going to see the Messiah appear. Leviticus 26, Leviticus 26 and verse 18. says, and if after these things you will not listen to me, this is uh, Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28 are the two chapters that are on the blessings of cursings of Israel. If they follow Yahweh's statutes and judgments and commandments, he'll bless them and they'll stay in the land. And if not, the land will vomit them out. And after these things, if you will not listen to me, then I will chastise you seven times more for your sins. And I will break the pride of your strength and will make your heavens as iron and your earth as bronze. And your strength shall be consumed in vain, and your land will not give her produce, and the tree of the land will not give its fruit. And if you walk contrary to me and, do, and are not willing to listen to me, then I will bring seven times more plagues. And if you continue in the chapter, it goes on seven times, seven times. This word in Hebrew, it's, it's a matter of condensement of punishment. And uh, if you look at a prophetic year, being 360 days, you times it by this seven condensement of punishment, and that means the punishment of Israel, if they're cast out of the land, will be 2,520 years. They would lose their sovereignty. Amazingly enough, when you look at the time that Israel was completely cast out of the land after the temple was destroyed, the temple was destroyed in 586, they, uh, when the book of Ezekiel was written in 573, 572 BC, and you add 2,520 years, you come exactly to 1948. Exactly. 
So the Bible not only predicted Israel's downfall, it predicted Israel's redemption, like we read in, in Psalm 102, that after the Holocaust uh, and that purification that came from there, Israel would be a nation again. And here we are. Here we are. No other nation in the history of, of humanity that has been God for 2,000 years has come up from the rubble of time and has been a nation again. Daniel 12 and verse 4. Daniel 12 and verse 4. But you, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book to the end time. Many shall travel back and forth and knowledge will be increased. Uh, even... <coughs> Excuse me. Even around the year 1900, knowledge was uh, doubling at a rate of around every hundred years. Knowledge would double, and then when we got just around maybe 20 years ago, it was doubling at the rate of every 18 months. And now it's at the rate of they say every about every one two months that knowledge is doubling. We've never seen anything like this, right? If you just think, just a couple of hundred years ago, not thousands of years ago. Not, not uh, uh, you know, uh, 5,000 years ago, but just a couple of hundred years ago in America, you had Lewis and Clark Expedition where the people were going out west and didn't even know where, where it ended, you know? People, the, the world has become such a small place. Google Earth has mapped everything and knowledge has been increasing. People running to and fro. Wow, you know? You can be one day in the United States, and within a matter of, of 12, 14 hours, you can be in China, that's 10,000 miles away. It's unbelievable, but the scripture, uh, I've given all messages just on this scripture, but just to prove clearly there's no other generation that this has happened, but this generation. No other generation ever with trains, cars, airplanes, and even spaceships. Can you imagine that even mankind has taken spaceships up to the moon and uh, Mars and other places. Uh, Joel 2 and verse 30. Joel 2 and verse 30. And I will give signs in the heaven and the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming and great and awesome day of Yahweh. And uh, going back to 2014, 2015, we had the, 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 the tree time of the four blood moons at the holy days. Pesach. Pesach and Sukkot and Pesach and Sukkot. And actually, if you keep the biblical calendar, even in 2.13, it really started Sukkot 2.13. There were actually five of them. But for now, we'll just talk about uh, 2014, 2015, right before the Shemitah. And this was a major sign because this is something that does not happen all the time. You know, This happened in 1492 and 1493 when the Jews were being expelled from Spain that this tree taught happened. You know, of the uh, blood moon and Pesach and Sukkot, Pesach and Sukkot for them together. And it didn't happen for, for, for literally, uh, I don't know if it's thousands, years, whatever, but, but like I said, it's, it's very, very rare that it would happen. And when does it happen again? 1948, 1949. It happens when Israel becomes a nation, the same thing, that Yahweh shows the sign. And then usually, like I said, it doesn't happen for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And yet, when does it happen again? 19 years later. It happens in 1967, 1968, when Jerusalem becomes in the hands of, of Israel again. Major thing, because Jerusalem is the center of the earth. And in 1948, Jerusalem was not part of Israel when they first became a nation. But in 1967, uh, during the Six-Day War, the Jews overtook Jerusalem and took it. And again, this... This four blood moons, Passover, Sukkot, Passover, Sukkot, happened in 67, 68. And now it won't happen again for whatever, 150, 200 years, whatever it is. So clearly a sign of Yahweh. But also showing us, and I want you to remember this, because numbers are very important with Yahweh. Extremely important. We've gone over this many times. The number four is a world number. Number five is the number of grace. Number three is a resurrection number and, and unity number. Uh, number six is the number of man. Number seven, number of completion. Nine, number of judgment, right? Uh, number 11, disunity number. Number 12, number of, of complete uh, government. And then you have number 40, number of trial, number of overcoming. You have number 50 is the, is the cycle, the, the jubilee cycle. And number 70 is an endpoint number. It's a number of a complete life cycle or complete cycle of a nation, it's, it's an end point number, number 70, and we're going to get into that in a little bit here. 
But this is the point that numbers are extremely important in Scripture. And when you see the convergence of all these numbers, what are the chances? What are the chances that that this these uh, blood moons would happen 48, 49, and 67, 68? You know, right at the time Israel becomes a nation, right at the times. So these are the two key points of end time, right? 1948 and 49, Israel becomes a nation. You know, remember the Jewish year goes from Aviv to Aviv, so it circles around two years in the uh, uh, Roman calendar, and then 67, 68. Those are the two key years that we're dealing with here. And then 2014, right? Right at that time where uh, the blood moons are happening, the tabernacle of David is found. Amazing. I talked about that many, many times. Not going to get into it, but an important part of Scripture because Yahweh says it in Amos 9, 11. And in that day, he will raise the tabernacle of David with the standing stone showing the stone the builders rejected has become the head of the corner. So right before another abomination that I'm going to talk about today, the Jews starting to kill a Passover lamb again, right before that, what happens? The stone that proves that he's the Messiah, the stone in Isaiah 28 you know, the stone in verse 16, the stone the builders rejected, right, has become the head of the corner. And uh, But Isaiah 28 talks about, you know, this, this stone, and maybe I should just go there for a second, because it's an important scripture. Isaiah 28 and verse 16. So Adonai Yahweh says this, Behold, I place in Mount Zion a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He who believes shall not hurry. And this is the stone that's there in the tabernacle of David. So again, that stone that has been covered for 3,000 years comes out in 214 right as the blood moons are starting there, right? And just a few short years before uh, the abomination that's coming now of starting animal sacrifices and again in the killing of the Passover. So amazing. These things, there's no way that this could just happen to happen that way. So now we go to Revelation 12, because in 2017, right, what happened? I mean, something that nobody can can make up, nobody can can pervert, or you know, it, it's it's the constellations, the Maseroth that Yahweh talks about in the book of Job. How can anybody, you know, change that? How can anyone go up in the heavens and start moving stars around to make them look like a, a constellation? But Revelation 12 says, and a great sign was seen in the heavens. A woman having been clothed with the sun, and the moon was underneath her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars, and having a babe in her womb, she cried, being in labor, and having birth pains to deliver. And again, this is the constellation of Betula, of the Virgin, right? And in 2017, only at that time, because there's usually four stars in the crown, but with the... With the uh, uh, the other planets of, of Mars that was there and Jupiter, uh, there was 12 stars around her head. Just like we see here. With the woman being clothed with the sun, the sun was in the midsection and the moon underneath her feet. September 23, 22 and 23 of 2017. So this is the only time in 7,000 years that this happens. This is not something that happens every day, every month, every year, or even every millennium. So one time that this happens, wow, this is a sign. And the reason why it's exciting when you see a biblical sign come that hasn't happened, happens once. But for me in 2017, if you remember when I talked about it, I was very sobered, not because of the sign, but if you read the rest of the chapter, I was saying, what's coming after this? Look in verse 3. And another sign was seen in the heavens. And behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads were seven crowns. And like we said, the other thing was that, I believe it was the planet of Mercury going into the uh, satanic constellation, you know, for around three years from that time. You know, amazing. But we see that after the sign of Revelation 12, there's another sign in a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and said with seven crowns. So what this means is, after that sign, we're close, very close. The beast power is going to be set up. It's very close to that. And then what comes also, drop down to verse 12, uh, or rather not verse 12, or verse 4 rather, and, he, and his tail drew the third part of the stars of the heaven, and he throws them to the ground. And the dragon stood before the woman being about to bear them, that she, so that 
so that when she bears, he might devour her child. And we know that Yeshua, when Yeshua, when, when Yeshua was born, that Satan tried to kill the children in Bethlehem and destroy it. But also, this is end time. This is Revelation. So we also know that in the time we're living in now, that right after that Revelation 12 sign, and then the beast power is going to be set up, and there's going to be war in heaven, and Satan is going to be cast down to the earth, and then he makes the earth his abode. Right now is a spirit, through the spirit of greed and lust and anger and all these other things, he, he influences the minds of men as the prince of the power of the airwaves. And that's why I keep warning the brethren, stay off the internet, stay off of TV and all these other things that Satan can influence you with. But now he comes to the earth and now he sets up his literal kingdom. And we're about there from this. And then what happens in the same chapter, right? In verse 13. And when the dragon saw that he was cast onto the earth, he pursued the woman who bore the male, the, the, the male child. So he comes after the congregation, and also he's coming after the nation of Israel. And two wings of a great eagle were given to the woman that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nursed there for a time, times, and half a times away from the serpent's face. And this is the wilderness. So that's what hit me. When the Revelation 12 sign happened in 2017, you know, just a year and a half ago, well, I had a lump in my throat thinking, <laughs> we're just about here. We're just about here now for the beast power to be set up, for the woman to go to the wilderness. And I said, Yahweh has given us, as a people, he's given us a, a short period of time for us to get our life together because you, just, you can't turn on holiness and you can't turn on sanctification like a light switch. It takes time, but you have to be working on it. Some are listening and some are working on it and changing and others are just going on in their life as if nothing's going to change because they have no faith. They have no faith that this is going to happen, but it is happening. And that's why the things I want to show you today are sobering, and they should excite you how close the kingdom is, but they should also uh, scare you, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, knowing how close we are now to these things going on. So where are we now in prophecy, right? Where are we now? And just as America has gotten worse each decade from the 1950s, and the start of the last generation until today, modern Israel also has. And it's really interesting because Babylon is judged in the end time for what they've done to Israel. And Israel is judged because they follow Babylon. Just like in, in ancient times, it was the same thing. And the same pattern is happening today. Prophecy repeats itself. So Israel is following the ways of Babylon. And like I said, that, that's why both countries will be judged. It's very interesting that Yahweh does say after 70 years he will judge Babylon, uh, you know, and Israel for her sins. And here we are, we'll talk about that 70 shortly. But I just want to go into a few different things here. Because over the last two years or so, it's really, really grieved me to see what's happening in Israel. I mean, Israel, is, it, it's always been a defiled land since they became a modern nation. But at least when they became a nation in 1948, and with Ben Gurion and even archaeology and these things, you had many, many people who believed in the Torah. You had people that were there who followed the Torah. The laws they tried to make in Israel according to the Torah, even though they started as a democracy, really, really bad way to start. They should have never started as a democracy. They stood, should have started as a theocracy, with the Torah being the national law of the land, which they didn't. And that's why we have the problem today, 70 years later. But... It has gotten worse every decade because with democracy, right, which means ruled by the people, the Laodiceans, as the people become worse, what happens? Uh, the laws are going to change because that's what happens. In a democracy, you could change the laws anytime you want to the will of the people. And now this is what's happening. And I want to share with you some things that have been happening. Like I said, for about two years, it's been really grief. But over the last few months, it's really gotten worse. What's happening over there has really gotten worse. And I want to share, number one, if you think about it, abortion in Israel per capita, per the amount of people in the country, is number one in the world. Oh, how that grieves, it should grieve your heart, right? Now, America has much more abortions because they have many more people. Israel has 8 million Jews in the country, maybe even a little less than that, around 8 million, 7.5 to 8 million Jews. America has 330 million people, right? So America has 2 million abortions a year, roughly. But Israel, for the amount of people they have, 
They have more abortions per capita than anywhere else in the world. And actually, Israel, over the last year or so, they actually passed the amount more abortions than children that died in the Holocaust. They had about a million and a half children that were killed in the Holocaust. I mean, terrible, those children. And you can go to the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem, and they have the Children's Museum, where you go in, it's all dark, they have little lights that are stars up there representing each child. You have to hold the rail because it's completely dark. And 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, they name those children. They just, there's, it's, it's a rotating recording that names those children that died in that Holocaust. And to think that this nation that is grieving over a million and a half children dying in the Holocaust would kill their own. They would have a Holocaust and kill more of their own children. More than a million and a half children now have been killed by abortion. And do the laws get better? No, no. Recently, just a few years ago, Israel made a new abortion law now where a woman can have an abortion for any reason. It does not have to be medical. So it doesn't have to be life-threatening or whatever. It could be anything. Uh, if, if, if there's adultery involved, you can have an abortion. If there's fornication involved, you can have an abortion. Matter of fact, the young girls who go to the military, because in Israel, male and female, all go to the military at 18 years old, be around 18 to 20, they go to the military. And the law is that a girl going to the military is given two free abortions by the government. Two free abortions. So this is the country of Israel. This is the country of Yahweh. And although it is Yahweh's land, and, and we love the people, and we love the land, this is the reality of what's happening there. This is the genocide that they are bringing upon themselves by killing their own people. And just like in America, if you say anything about it, you said you're racist then. So where, where is the, the life of the unborn child? Where is the sanctity of life when they're killing their own people? Leviticus 20 and verse 8. Because it really, it's like in the Old Testament of giving their seed to Moloch. That's really what you're doing. It's, it's I think, the worst abomination in the world before Yahweh, for people to kill their own seed. It just shows you how defiled this world is. And Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, And you shall say to the sons of Israel, Any man of the sons of Israel, and of the aliens who are living in Israel, gives of his seed to Moloch, shall certainly be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. And I, I shall set my face against that man, and shall cut him off from the midst of the people. For he has given his seed to Moloch, so as to defile my sanctuary and pollute my holy name. And if the people of the land truly hide their eyes from that man, as he gives his seed to Moloch, so as not to put him to death, then I shall set my face against that man, against his family, and shall cut him off, and all who go whoring after him, even going whoring after Moloch, from the midst of their people. And the person who turns to mediums and to spiritualists, and who go whoring after them, I will set my face against that person, and cut him off from the midst of his people. And you shall sanctify yourselves, and you shall be holy, for I am Yahweh your Elohim, and you shall keep my statutes and do them. I am Yahweh who is sanctifying you. And not only the abortion, but it talks about going after spiritualists in Israel today, yoga and New Age. In a tiny little nation like Israel, they have a New Age conference in Haifa. 50,000 people will come. People all into all that stuff, all into New Age and yoga and all that. So, it's amazing. Uh, how they allow that, but it is an abomination before Yahweh. You go down to verse 13. And a man who lies with a male, as one lies with a woman, both of them have done a detestable thing. Surely they shall die, their blood shall be on them. And homosexuality is not only legal in Israel, it's encouraged. I remember when we first started our ministry there, you know, 21 years ago, uh, 22 years ago, what would happen? There would be a, they want to have a parade in Jerusalem, homosexual parade, and there'd be such a stink about it, they'd have to cancel the parade. Not anymore. Not anymore. Elat is the homosexual capital of the world in Elat. And it is growing. We couldn't believe this last Passover that just, just passed a few days ago. Uh, walking in the streets of Jerusalem and seeing gay people holding hands, even kissing the gay earrings. I mean, they are, they are promoting it because now it's normal. It's normal and it's a way of life and it's detestable to Yahweh. It's detestable. And nobody is really standing up against it, not even the Orthodox. I was shocked 
where I was uh, a few months ago. I was at the Knesset. I, I think I wrote about it to a special meeting that they had there with some world leaders uh, against anti-Semitism. And I was talking with a rabbi who was justifying it. And I was telling him, what an abomination that Israel is allowing this here. And he said, no, 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 no. For us, it's bad. But for those people, they're born that way. I'm saying, you're crazy. You're absolutely crazy. There is no homosexual gene. It's, it's something that is a learned behavior that is, is, is just absolutely evil in the eyes of Yahweh. So, and the government supports it. It's one of the reasons I, I did not support the government uh, in this last election, because I remember Prime Minister Netanyahu just a year or two ago, when, uh, I forget, when nation Saudi Arabia, one of those nations was uh, having a very bad punishment against homosexual behavior, and he was proudly saying, how Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East, and we gladly accept homosexuals into Israel. And that's going to cause their downfall. Ezekiel 20 and verse 10. Ezekiel 20 and verse 10. Another thing that just happened in the last one to two months is they changed the laws of the Sabbath. Oh, how I used to love that Israel was the only place in the world that every Friday afternoon, whether people were religious or not, whether they kept the Sabbath or not, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, and everything closed down. It was just, it, it, it wasn't even just a religious belief, it was part of their culture. But as the world is changing, the Israelis don't want that anymore. They don't want it. Our, our landlord was telling us, she used to drive through Tiberias and she'd be the only car on Saturday. Now 20,000 people are there. And she's loving it. She's loving it. Ezekiel 20 and verse 10. I caused them to go out from the land of Egypt and brought them into the wilderness. And I gave them my statutes and I made them know my judgment, which if a man does, he will even live by them. And I also gave them my Sabbath to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am Yahweh who sets them apart. But the house of Israel rebelled against me in the wilderness. They did not walk in my statutes and they despised my judgments, which if a man does them, he will even live by them. And they greatly profaned my Sabbaths. Then I said, I will pour out my fury on them in the wilderness to consume them. And if you read the rest of Ezekiel 20 and many other parts in the Bible, you will find out one of the main reasons, if not the main reason, that Israel was expelled from the land was because of defiling the Sabbath. The Sabbath is the one commandment, it's the test commandment, it shows that Yahweh is Elohim. And like I say, in Israel, there's accountability to your actions because the land will vomit you out. And... This is bad. This is bad that now in major cities, you know, Tel Aviv, Tiberias, Haifa, and major cities, that the Sabbath now has just been desecrated. That it's everything is open, there's buying and selling, everything is going on. And this is a major problem uh, that just started in the last one, two months. Jeremiah 5, Jeremiah 5, starting in verse 1. Jeremiah 5 and starting in verse 1. Roam around in Jerusalem streets and see now and know and seek in her places if you can find a man, if there is one who does justice, who seeks truth, and I will pardon her. And though they say as Yahweh lives, surely they swear falsely. O oh, Yahweh, are not your eyes for the truth? You struck them, but they felt no pain. You consumed them, yet they, yet they refused to take correction. And in 70 years of Israel being a nation, they went through suffering and war and terror and all these things because they've been disobedient. And yet are they learning by it? No. No, they're becoming more obstinate. And now they feel because the IDF is so strong and we have nuclear weapons, nobody's going to mess with us. Nobody's going to mess with us. That's You talk to the average Israeli, that's what they feel. We can take care of ourselves. Not that we have Yahweh, but we have the IDF. You consume them, yet they refuse to take correction. They made their faces harder than rock. They refused to return. So I said, surely they are poor. They are foolish. For they do not know the way of Yahweh, the judgment of their Elohim. Wow. So when we're looking at this happening, then drop down to verse 23. What does Yahweh say is going to happen here? But to this people, there is a revolting and a rebellious heart. They have turned and are gone. And they do not say in their heart, let us now fear Yahweh our Elohim, who gives both the former and the latter rain in its season. 
He keeps for us the appointed weeks of the harvest. Your iniquities have turned away these things, and your sins have withheld good from you. For among my people are found wicked ones. They lie in wait as one who sets snares. They set a trap to catch men, like a cage full of birds, so their houses are full of treachery. On account of this, they have become great and grown rich. And that's another problem. Israel's economy is going great right now, and that's why they don't see any problems. They see, just like in America, as long as the economy is going good, nobody's going to turn around, nobody's going to repent. They have become fat, they shine. Yea, they pass over the deeds of the evil. They do not judge the cause of the orphan, that they may prosper. And they do not vindicate the right of the needy. Shall I not visit for these things, declares Yahweh? Shall not my soul be avenged on such a nation as this? There is an appalling and horrible thing that has happened in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests bear rule by their hands, and my people love it so. And what will you do at the end of it? Wow, and it's so true today. The people love it that way. They're happy. They're saying, no, it's fine. They're saying there's no problem, and the people love to have it that way. They've really interesting. I just read an article the other day. There's a new government coming. It should be formed within about a month. And they said the first law now they're going to bring up to the new government is not to do any deleavening anymore during Pesach. That it should be something if the religious want to take out the leaven, that's fine. But the average person, they don't have nothing to do with that. They're not religious. And 80 to 90 percent aren't. That is the very first law they want to bring up in the Knesset. I don't know if it'll pass. I pray it doesn't. But that's the first law they want to bring up now to now. They already did the Sabbath. And I'm telling you, as once you start moving in this direction, the same as in America, it's very, very quick that it moves. And Yahweh can only put up with so much. Jeremiah 8 and verse 11. Jeremiah 8 and verse 11. <clears throat> For they have healed the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace, and there is no peace. Were they ashamed when they had done hateful things? They were not at all ashamed, nor did they know how to blush. But they shall fall among those who fall in the time of their punishment. They will wither, says Yahweh. I will utterly consume them, says Yahweh. No grapes will be on the vine or figs on the fig tree. Even the leaf withers, and I will give to them those who pass over them. Why do we sit still? Gather yourself and let us enter into the fortified cities. And let us be silent there for... Yahweh or Elohim has made us silent there and he has made us drink poisonous water because we have sinned against Yahweh. So here it is that Israel is rejecting the Torah. They're looking for the false peace. And it's real interesting that Yahweh says to his people, why are we sitting still? Gather yourself and let us enter, enter into the fortified cities. I gave a message a short time ago on the cities of refuge. And I really think it's the time. It's the time we need to start seriously be thinking about entering these cities of refuge. Because when judgment is coming, you don't want to be there where the judgment is. And I'll tell you, we've been in Israel for wars. When there was war that started like in 206, we were outside the land and we went back to the land to be there during the war with them. Where we were living on the kibbutz, they turned it into a uh, temporary base. Most of our neighbors left. We had stayed there. We gave Bibles to the soldiers. We prayed with them. We baked them cookies because we wanted to support them. But now what's coming is from Yahweh. What's coming is their judgment for the sin they're doing. And I, I, I want to be judged for my own sins, not for the sins of my brother Judah. First it was with Clinton, President Clinton, then President Bush, President Obama, and now President Trump. The deal of the century, they're calling it. Uh, logic will tell me it won't work. The Palestinians don't even want to hear it. But the rest of the Arab world have already accepted this peace plan, and it'll be very interesting. It's going to come out in June to see what happens here. But when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes. And while I've been saying it for the last few months, watch, because I've seen parts of the plan. They want to divide Jerusalem, and uh, who knows? But at the time we're in, and the convergence of all these things, this peace plan might just work. Who knows? Only Yahweh. Joel 3 and 1 and 2. Joel 3 and 1 and 2, but what happens when this peace comes? For behold, in those days and at that time, the days we're living in now, when I bring again the exiles of Judah and Jerusalem, they're there, I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat. That's the first scripture I read. And I will enter into judgment with them there for my people and my inheritance Israel, 
whom they have scattered among the nations, and they divided my land. They divided my land. So who knows? Maybe a world army like the UN will force Israel into the peace plan that they don't want, but something is going to happen. But clearly, this is what Scripture says, that when the land is divided, the day of Yahweh comes in his wrath. And we know the beast power from Daniel 11, the beast power will make his seat in Jerusalem. And there's a time where Yahweh's people have to flee the place. So all these things are happening very quickly, and we have a convergence of all this coming. But just coming in, the, in, in, in a little over a month, you know, this June, President Trump will be unveiling what he's calling the deal of the century, peace plan between Palestinians. And then I think the most troubling thing to me that has happened in Israel is after 2,000 years of the temple being destroyed because the Lamb of Yahweh was slain from the foundation of the world, his sacrifice was there, and it's very interesting, because the temple is not against the promises of Yahweh. Animal sacrifices are not against the promises of Yahweh. Yahweh made those sacrifices as a shadow toward his son Yeshua. But after Yeshua came, and after Rome, uh, Hebrews 10 tells us his sacrifice is in perpetuity, and where forgiveness is, there's no need for other sacrifices. Uh, remember, Yahweh, their mind, the mind of, of Israelites, for all those hundreds of years of the temple, he had to give them time to change, and he did. He gave them 40 years, which is the number of trial, the number of overcoming. <clears throat> and then after 40 years, Yahweh destroyed the temple and there would be no more sacrifices at all until the millennium comes and the Messiah would be here, Yeshua. He would re help to rebuild the third temple, the millennial temple. And then the Jews that would be resurrected or the Israelites that would be resurrected at that time as human beings, Daniel 12, 1 and 2, they would pick up in that old system and there would be a time period. Nobody knows how long, but a time period that they would come from the old covenant into the new covenant. In the end time, there's nowhere that Yahweh sanctions the killing of animals again. And starting last Passover, the Jews started killing a lamb again at, below the Temple Mount. Not in the Temple Mount, because they can't get into the Temple Mount. Below the Temple Mount, which is not the right place any way you look at it. But it's very interesting, because when you look at Mark 13, 14, Mark 13, 14 says, When you see that which was spoken of by Daniel the prophet, the sign of unclean desolation, that was standing where it should not be, then let him who reads understand... Then let those in Judea flee into the mountains. So, uh, is this the abomination of desolation? It is a abomination of desolation. It's probably not the one, although it's, 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 it's a type and it's leading to it. Because the abomination of desolation is about the final rejection by the nation of Yeshua as the Messiah. And he is the Passover lamb. Every sacrifice is toward him, but particularly the Passover Unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you have no, no, nothing to do with me. And this Passover, understanding about being part of his very body, wow, this has been the, the, the most meaningful Passover in my life. And to see the Jewish priests killing a lamb, it's not just a coincidence. A lamb has not been killed since the destruction of the temple, and 2,000 years later now, as all these things are coming into the convergence, Yahweh just allowed it to happen. They tried to do it before. Yahweh didn't allow it. But now he allowed it. He allowed it to happen. And it is an abomination. It is an abomination. And it's the last rejection of Yeshua. Daniel 8. Daniel 8 and verse 14. Because I don't think people really understand about the abomination of desolation. Because the abomination of desolation, it's about the nation of Israel and the world rejecting Yeshua as king of the universe and, and the only way to have your sins forgiven. And what happens is when that happens, when Yeshua is completely rejected by Israel and by the world, uh, this is where we talked about in Revelation, right? There's going to be war in heaven and uh, Michael, you know, is going to be fighting. Maybe let me, let me read here in Daniel 8 first and then I'll go back to Revelation 12. Daniel 8, and I'm going to start here in verse 8. He says, Then the he-goat became very great, and when he was mighty, the great horn was shattered. And in its place came up four notable ones toward the four winds of the heavens. 
And out of one of them came a little horn, which became very great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the bountiful land, which is Israel. So the little horn is the anti-Messiah. So <clears throat> there's a war that's coming. We know that. We read about it in, in uh, Joel, the third chapter, the first scripture we read here. But when this war comes, what's going to happen? The war is going to come, and it's going to, it's going to uh, weaken the nations after this World War III. And then the little horn is going to come up from them, the anti-Messiah. And what happens? Verse 10, he became great even to the host of heaven, even up into heaven itself. And it caused some of the host and the stars to fall to the ground and to trample this. This is Revelation 12. Go back to Revelation 12. Revelation 12. And verse 3. And his tail drew the, the dragon, the, the saying, drew the third part of the stars of the heaven and throws them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman about to bear that she, so that when she bears, he might devour her child. So here it is, the same as we'll read in Revelation. This is it. This is what's happening here, right? And the war is in heaven. Satan is being cast down to the earth. And a massive army was given him against the continual sacrifice because of sin. What is the continual sacrifice? It's Yeshua's grace. Hebrews 10 says his grace is in perpetuity. So the daily sacrifice that was done in the morning and the evening was a type of Yeshua's sacrifice, it was there every day to show that Yahweh's grace is continual. And they threw the truth to the ground, and it worked out and pushed forward. Then I heard a certain holy one speaking, and another holy one said to the one who spoke, Until when is the vision, the continual sacrifice, and the devastating rebellious revolt, right? Just like we read, uh, the end will not come unless the man of sin comes first, right? In Thessalonians, and there's a great rebellion. This is what it's talking about. And a devastating revolt to give both the sanctuary and the massive crowd to be trampled. And he said to me, for 2,300 evening and morning, then the sanctuary will be made righteous. So here it is. The, the, the daily uh, sacrifice was a morning and evening. So 2,023 morning and evening sacrifices divided by half is 1,150 days. So it's literally almost three years. It's about a month less than three years. And... Exactly 45 days, which is kind of interesting when you're looking at uh, Daniel 12, when there's 45 days difference in Daniel's 12, 11, and 12, but I'm not going to go into there now. But this is when Yahweh's grace is taken from the world. His grace is going to be taken from the world, and then what's happening here? We're going into that time. We're going into that time where the beast power is here. We're going into the time where uh, he's coming after the brethren, you know, that when, when Satan makes war with the saints and overcomes them, most of them are Laodiceans, the Philadelphians will be in the wilderness. But wow, we are just about there in this time, the time of Jacob's trouble. John 16 and verse 7. John 16 and verse 7 says, But I tell you the truth, it is better for you that I should go. For if I do not go away, the Redeemer will not come to you. But if I go, I will send it to you. And having come, that one will convict the world concerning sin and concerning righteousness and concerning judgment. Concerning sin, because they did not believe in me, right? Sin, the Passover. Concerning righteousness, because I'm going to the Father that you no longer see me. Righteousness, Shavuot, all your commandments are righteousness, the giving of the law. And concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. Sukkot, the fall holy days. So the world first, the first part of the world, until Yeshua came, the world was in sin. They couldn't have their sins forgiven. There was no Savior yet. Now, from the time of Yeshua till now, we've been in the time, the, 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 the dispensation of grace, people say, right? Where you can have your sins forgiven, and the sun shines on the wicked as well as the, the righteous, because Yahweh gives people time to repent. But now, we're heading into judgment. It's a short time. It may only last maybe seven, ten years. Not, not that long, you know? But it's going to be a short time of judgment, and then the kingdom comes. So this is the time here that we're talking about in Daniel. When the abomination of desolation happens, it's Yahweh taking his grace away from the earth at that time because of the rejection of Yeshua as the Messiah. And it brings total destruction on the earth and the rise of the beast power. Okay, I want to go into a paper now. Why then? I mean, face it. Things are bad in Israel. They've been bad for a while. But the immorality itself, 
we can't say just because there's homosexuality in the streets or just because the, they're doing more abortions that Yahweh's judgment is definitely going to come shortly or even this year, right? Uh, so why why do I think though that the the the, the time of Jacob's trouble and Yahweh's judgment on the nation is so close because of the numbers that come, right? Like I said, numbers are really, really important in Scripture, and 70 is an extremely important number because 70 symbolizes the life cycle and end point. So I'm going to just show you here. I don't have time to go over all the Scriptures. You can write them down and look at them later. But I'm just going to tell you the number 70. Uh, the post-flood world was populated by 70 descendants of Noah, resulting in 70 nations. That's from Genesis 10, right? So again, it's an end point. It's a life cycle. After the flood, there's 70 descendants who populate the world. Terah, the father of Abraham, was 70 years old when Abraham was born. Genesis eleven twenty six. 26. The nation of Israel began with 70 Hebrew, Hebrews who migrated to Egypt. Deuteronomy 10, 22. Moses appointed 70 elders to be a governing body of Israel. Numbers eleven sixteen. The Jews were liber liberated from captivity in Babylon after 70 years, Jeremiah 29. Yahweh's plan of redemption for Israel and Jerusalem is comprised of 70 weeks, Daniel 9, 70 weeks of years, right? And then Jerusalem will be purified after the 77s. Yeshua sent 70 disciples to harvest the fields of believers, Luke 10. A typical human lifespan is 70 years. We said that Psalm 90 in verse 10. Israel's greatest ruler, King David, died at the age of 70, right? So it shows an end point. It shows a life cycle, 2 Samuel 5, 4. In Jeremiah 25, 11 and 12, after 70 years, Babylon is judged. It's an end point. Babylon judges the nations for 70 years, and then there's judged. So 70 is a really important number. It's an important number that shows it's, 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 it's a cycle, it's a cycle, whether it's a life cycle of a human, a life cycle of a nation, like Babylon or Israel. It's a cycle, and it's an end point. 70 years and boom, then the end point happens. So seeing how 70 symbolizes end points, let's look now in Israel's history to show this 70-year pattern. Okay, From the destruction of the first temple in 586 BC to the completion of the second temple, in 516, 515, is 70 years. So it's one cycle. The destruction of the first to the completion of the second is exactly 70 years, one cycle. From the completion of the second temple, 516, 515, to the completion of the wall around Jerusalem, right? That's when the decree went out for the 70 years, 445 BC. Again, 70 years. 70 years. So... Destruction of the first, the building of the second, 70 from the building of the second to the building of the wall and the decree to go out from the Daniel 9 prophecy, 70 years, 70 years. Not a coincidence, right? Now, the, in modern times, the most significant 70-year interval corresponds with those dates of 48 and 67. Remember, 48, 49 was when we had the four blood moons, 67, 68, the four blood moons. Those are the two pivotal years. One, Israel's becoming a nation, one Jerusalem is in the hands of the nation of Israel once again. So when we look at from the first Jewish settlement in modern Israel, it was in Petfa Tikva in 1878, the first settlement that comes in modern Israel, and you add 70 years to it, you come to 1948, the year Israel becomes a nation. From the first Zionist Congress, Theodore Herzl, the first Zionist Congress in 1897, that's what started modern-day Zionism. In 70 years, you come to 1967. You come exactly to the time when Jerusalem becomes a nation. So it's not just ancient times that, that Yahweh is using the 70 as a prophetic. It's modern times he's using 70 as the prophetic, which is really, really, really interesting. So now, when you go to Matthew 24, right, and Yeshua says, this generation will not pass, until all these things happen, right? So he says it all happened in one generation. And then in Psalm 102, he tells us the generation that saw the Holocaust is the same generation that's going to see the kingdom of Yahweh come. And now it's really interesting because now let's go to Psalm 90. Let's read about what a generation is, right? Because the Holocaust started in 1938, right? And those people that went through the Holocaust 
Some of them are alive today, but not that many of them. We'll be the same people to see the kingdom. And he says in Psalm 90 and verse 10, the days of our years are 70, right? It's a lifestyle. And if by any strength you live 80 years, yet their pride is labor and vanity for it soon passes and we fly away. Wow, really interesting. So the lifestyle is 70 years, but he says, and if by any strength you live 80 years? Well, this is exactly now 70 years since the nation of Israel was born, but it's 80 years since the beginning of the Holocaust. And those are the two scriptures that Yeshua gave us. Matthew 24, he says one generation, 70 years. In Psalm 102, he says those who saw the Holocaust will be those who see the kingdom, 80 years. Both of them converging, both of them by the scripture. So by strength, right? The days of our years are 70, if by any strength live 80 years. Isn't it really interesting? 70 years since 1948, Israel becomes a nation. 80 years since the beginning of the Holocaust, 1938. Wow. Then the next, verse 11. Who knows the power of your anger? And as your fear is, so is your fury. That what happens after that. After this cycle comes Yahweh's fury on the earth. So there's no coincidences with Yahweh. And the time cycle that's there is the time cycle we're looking at. This Passover, which was a very, very special Passover, was the 70th Passover since Israel's been a nation. This was the 70th Passover. So the fact that Israel's 70th year, which is concluding this year, 219, marks the convergence of three prophetic time spans and the drafting of the most anticipated peace plan, you know, in the last 50 years, uh, President Trump is calling it the, the plan of a lifetime, I believe that it shows the tribulation days can't be far away because 70 is the end point. So we're seeing all these things and it's happened in our time from the first settlement to the time Israel becomes a nation, 70 years from the first Jewish uh, Zionist Congress to the time Jerusalem becomes in the hands of Israel, 70 years. And now 70 years have passed for both of them. And this is why Yeshua links the time of his return to a definite generation time span. He told us it. It would all happen in one generation. And that's why scriptures is filled with uh, typologies of 70, you know, and also 70 years of Babylon to rule the nations and Babylon is destroyed. And we're just there with all of them. And it's also interesting as today ends, this year ends uh, Israel's 70th year and the 70th Passover since they become a modern nation. It's also... The 70, there's been 70 jubilees since the Exodus. 70 jubilees have happened since the Exodus. So, uh, wow, <laughs> wow, it's, it's really, and then we look at the Revelation 12 sign, which already happened, and then we see what happens after the sign. Every single thing of prophecy is lining up. Every single last thing the prophecy says is lining up, which means, like I said, the times and the seasons, I'm not making any predictions. I'm reading you the scriptures. I'm giving you the information. And the times are in Yahweh's hand. To me, it seems the time of Jacob trouble, we are just at the door. But what does that mean? Does that mean a few months? Does that mean a few years? But the fact that they started killing an animal again in Jerusalem after 2,000 years, a Passover, right there below the Temple Mount, tells us, tells me anyway, that, wow, the abomination of desolation, the time of Jacob's trouble, all of this stuff is upon us, beside the sinful nature, beside all the things that's going, going on. Jeremiah 30 and verse 1. Jeremiah 30 and verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah from Yahweh saying, so speak Yahweh Elohim of Israel, saying, Write for yourself all the words that I have spoken to you in a book. For lo, the days come, says Yahweh, that I will turn the captivity of my people Israel and Judah, says Yahweh, and I will cause them to return to the land that I gave their fathers, and they shall possess it. And one other grief sin that modern Judah has done in this time is 
that in 70 years, it's no doubt, it, it's prophetic that they're back in the land, that Yahweh has blessed them, Yahweh has been with them, but they have not allowed their brother Ephraim to return. And I can tell you right now, I don't care if we go another thousand years, Judah is not going to enlarge the border of their tent. They will not let Ephraim in, and that's why Yahweh is going to have to do something to take their sovereignty away, to let Israel come back, because there's 12 tribes of Israel. There is not one tribe of Israel, there's 12 tribes of Israel. And this fact, part of the time of Jacob's trouble that's coming, is because Judah's refusal to allow their brother back in. And these are the words that Yahweh spoke concerning Israel and concerning Judah. For so says Yahweh, we have heard a sound of trembling and dread, and not of peace, right? They've had this peace plan going on since 93, Oslo, Roadback, all the same thing, and all it's brought is terror and, 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 and travail. And now, <coughs> this year, they're going to try to do it again. They're going to try to do it once again. So it says, Yahweh, we've heard a sound of trembling and dread, and not of peace. Ask now and see whether a male is giving birth. Why do I see every man with his hands on his loins like a woman giving birth? And all faces are turned to paleness. Alas, for that day is great, for none is like it. It is the time of Jacob's trouble, but he will be saved out of it. And this is going to happen not just in Israel, but to all the Israelite nations. America, uh, Europe, all the Israelite nations are going to go through this judgment because of what's happening. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. It's the time when the beast power is going to be on this earth. It's the time where the saints of Yahweh, Daniel 7, will the, the beast power will overcome them. And it's going to be a really, really bad time. For it shall be in that day, says Yahweh of hosts, I will break this yoke from your neck and I will burst your bonds and strangers will not again enslave him. But they shall serve Yahweh their Elohim and David their king, whom I will raise up to them. And certainly it's end time because David is even being resurrected. And you, O my servant Jacob, do not fear, says Yahweh. Do not be terrified, O Israel, for lo, I will save you from afar and your seed from the land of their captivity. And Jacob shall return and have quiet and be untroubled, and no one will make him afraid. And after this time of Jacob's trouble, it will be the great regathering. That's when Yahweh and Yeshua will return and they will bring all of the Israelites back to the land. For I am with you, says Yahweh, to save you. Though I make a full end among all nations where I have scattered you, yet I will not make a full end with you, but I will correct you justly. And I will not leave you unpunished. So says Yahweh, your break cannot be cured. Your wound is grievance. There is no one to judge your cause for your ulcer. There is no healing medicines for you. The land is defiled. All those loving you have forgotten you. They do not seek you. For I have wounded you with the wound of an enemy, with the chastisement of a cruel one, because of the greatness of your iniquity. Your sins are many. Why do you cry out over your crushing? Your pain is incurable. For the greatness of your iniquity, your sins are many, so I have done these things to you. And Israel is going to see. They're making pacts now with Babylon, even trying to make pacts with Saudi Arabia. And they're going to see when this time of trouble comes and Israel loses their sovereignty, nobody's going to be there. Two-thirds of the people are going to die. Zechariah 13 and verse 7. And then the people that are left will cry out to Yahweh. Zechariah 13. O sword, awake against my shepherd and against the mighty warrior who is my associate, talking about Yeshua, says Yahweh of hosts, strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered and I will turn my hand on the little ones. So it's the rejection of Yeshua that brings Yahweh's judgment. And look what he says, and it will be in all the land, says Yahweh, two parts in it shall be cut off and perish, but the third shall be left in it. And I will bring the third part through the fire and I will refine them as silver is refined and I will try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name and I will answer them. I will say it is my people and they will say Yahweh is my Elohim. So two thirds of the people there are going to die and the last third are going to be tried through the fire. It's going to be, it's going to be a, a, a horrible, horrible time that's coming in the land. Jeremiah 9 and verse 11. Jeremiah 9 and verse 11. And I will make Jerusalem ruins a den of jackals, and I will make the cities of Judah a desolation without inhabitant. Who is the wise man that can understand this? And he to whom the mouth of Yahweh has spoken, <clears throat> that he may declare it. Why does the land perish? It is burned up like the wilderness, so that no one passes through. And Yahweh says, because they have forsaken my Torah, which I sent before them, and have not obeyed my voice, and have not walked in it, but have walked after the stubbornness of their own heart, and after the Baals, 
which their fathers taught them. And that's what's happening here today. That it's sad to see it. It's sad to see it for us. Living there more than 20 years, doing ministry there for 22 years. And to see the defilement that's happening there. But the defilement is bringing the this time of great trouble that's there. And what does Yahweh tell us? He tells us, Jeremiah 8, we were going over this before. Jeremiah 8 and verse 14. When he's saying, I will, verse 13, I will utterly consume them, says Yahweh, you know, and all these things will happen. And he says, why do you sit still, gather yourselves, and let us enter into the fortified cities, and let us be silent there. For Yahweh Elohim has made us silent there, and he has made us drink poisonous waters because we have sinned against Yahweh. Why do we sit still, gather yourself, and enter into the fortified cities? It's really the time that's coming here to enter the wilderness. It's time to get to the city of refuge. Uh, we're working hard setting these things up, but the time is short. The time is short, and the fact that all this convergence of 70 years is all coming today on Israel, the 70th year of a nation, the 70th year, the 70th Passover there, the 70th year from the time of the first settlement, the 70th year from the time of being a nation. All these things, the 70s that are coming, and 70 is a number of a life cycle or an end point that we're seeing all these things come. Jerem uh, Isaiah 26, the last scripture I'm going to go into here. Isaiah 26 and verse 20. Maybe I'll even start in verse 18. It says, We conceive, we writh, as it were, we gave birth to wind. We have not worked salvation for the earth, and those living in the world have not fallen. Your dead ones shall live, my dead body. They shall rise up, awake and sing, those who dwell in the dust. Right? So, uh, for the dew of lights is your dew, and the earth shall cast out departed spirits. So we see this is talking about the resurrection. And then what does he say in verse 20? Come, my people, go in your rooms and shut your doors behind you. Hide a little moment until the fury passes. For behold, Yahweh comes out of his place to visit his iniquity on those dwelling on the earth. The earth shall also reveal her blood and shall no more cover over her slain ones. So you have the beast power coming and setting up for 42 months, controlling the earth and all the wickedness that's going on. You have the people of Yahweh that need to go and hide themselves going to the wilderness, prepare, and then you have the wrath of Yahweh that comes on the earth, and then you have the return of Yeshua that comes right after that. <clears throat> uh, when we look at all the convergence of this, it really shows us that this stuff is really at the door. And like I said, I'm not making any prediction because only Yahweh knows what that means. Because he is giving his people time to prepare. He's given us time. We've had a couple of years now. We're in the middle. This is exactly the three and a half point of the seven year cycle. Really, really interesting. Three and a half, uh, the, the half point. Because the half point is, is when the, the woman flees to the wilderness. It doesn't mean it's this cycle. But it is at the half point cycle. So we're at the half point cycle that we see. And Yahweh has shown, at least to me personally, many signs that we are here at this time. The convergence of the 70s cannot be a coincidence with all these things. <clears throat> and only Yahweh knows, will he give us another few years to get ourselves together? I certainly hope so. Or is something going to come quickly when this uh, peace plan comes out? I don't know. But all I know is we are in that time. We've passed now. You have the time where you had the sinful time before Yeshua came. Then you had the time of grace that was on the world till now. And now we're entering into the time of judgment. The sin in this world is just overbearing. The rejection of Yeshua is unbelievable. And it's the beginning. It's the beginning of this last phase of judgment that, like I said, I don't know if this phase is for seven years, 10 years, 14 years, but it's not a very uh, long time. We know that because everything will happen in one generation. And here we are. We're at the end of that generation. Isn't that really interesting? Like he said, the generation, so the Holocaust is the generation that will go in the kingdom. Yeshua says this will all happen in one generation. We're 70 years, one generation from that. And he says, and if you last 80 years, Psalm 90, and the people from the Holocaust, from
from the beginning of the Holocaust exactly 80 years. So it is really interesting though that if we go back, because history does repeat itself, that Yeshua uh, in, in the year 68 at Shavuot in 68, Yahweh took the brethren from Jerusalem, he took them out of there and he took them to the wilderness in Pella in Jordan. And the destruction came almost two years later, you know, in 70. I think it was even more than two years because it was uh, uh, the 9th of Av, it was in August uh, 70 AD. But he took them two years beforehand so they can prepare themselves, so they can get themselves ready, so that they can compare themselves in the wilderness before these things happen. And who knows, because like I said, Yahweh is telling us now is the time. We have to continue making these cities of refuge. We have to continue doing the kibbutzes. We have to continue coming out of the world. But we've turned a corner here. This Passover is a turning of a corner for his congregation, but also in each of us in our personal lives. And we really have to take it serious. We have to embrace Yeshua as not only King of Kings and Master of Masters, but as our personal Savior who did uh, the great sacrifice for us. And it's the year of the bride, you know, and what that means. So Yahweh needs to show us about the wilderness. He needs to prepare us for the time of Jacob's trouble and the next Shemitah that's only a few years away. So the first three and a half years now, uh, I hope you were preparing. But these next three and a half years, you better prepare because the time is now. Yahweh bless. Haksameah.